It's been a week in which Northern Ireland's past has dominated the present. The Attorney General John Larkin's call for an end to troubles prosecutions and public inquiries caused uproar among victims groups and the majority of political parties. But is there any merit in Mr Larkin's proposals for dealing with the past? Martina Purdy has been investigating the challenge of letting go and what happens if we don't. A report contains some flash photography. The Good Friday Agreement was our roadmap out of conflict. But what about the past? How do we escape that particular maze? Bring some truth and justice and acknowledgement to victims, and then we as a society can move on. We have to have um, a process in place that is as all-encompassing as, and as a victim and survivor centred. If we spend our time trying to say, can we find the one thing that will deal with the past? I don't think we'll find that one thing. For a really genuine healing, we've got to find some genuine way of telling the truth about the past, not in a way of seeking vengeance, but of being honest about what really happened. But what is the truth and who is a victim? Issues so divisive they continue to imprison us in the past and threaten the health of our society and our politics. It's cancerous because one group of us in Northern Ireland want the truth. We want to know that the British government were as bad as the IRA, that they did illegal things. And another group of people want to make sure that the IRA were the real, real, real baddies in this. And by the way, the UVF weren't good either. So we fight around those issues and we have fought about those issues constantly. Now, if we actually can get past that, both at an individual level and at a communal level, then we could actually, I think, get on with things. Can we do that? I don't know. Uh, our politicians want to solve it in their way that suits their constituency. You can't do that. You can only solve this if you solve it for everybody. Dennis Bradley, along with Robin Eames, tried to solve it, to end the piecemeal approach to the past, but their report was overshadowed by rows. We are the victims. Everybody's a victim. You think you intimidate me, but don't, 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 don't try it. Just stop it, will you? So we never did get the legacy commission they suggested as an alternative to public inquiries, a body that would probe unresolved cases, get information and still allow for the possibility of justice. So what's the solution? Well, myself and a few other people did a major report uh, five years ago, uh, which, by the way, would have been finished now and we would have moved towards this famous amnesty that we're talking about and that everybody's now beginning to kind of point up. The other thing, by the way, people tell lies around this all the time. All the time. The people who want an amnesty keep saying they don't want an amnesty. <laughs> and the people who say that they want truth don't want to tell the truth. Certainly, even a hint of some kind of amnesty for those who killed as one means of getting to the truth is extremely controversial. As the Attorney General found when he suggested not an amnesty, but a new law that would end all prosecutions, inquests and inquiries linked to the troubles. Despite what you might think from uh, my organization's name, uh, we are opposed to blanket amnesties. A fundamental tenet of international human rights law is that victims of crime, victims of human rights violations should have access to justice and that must be a possibility that is pursued in Northern Ireland. In many cases, perhaps most cases now, that isn't going to be possible and truth recovery is the best we can hope for, but it must be a possibility. Anything else would be letting down victims. While most victims oppose the Attorney General's suggestion, some former senior RUC officers lauded it. And those who have studied other conflicts say these approaches to unresolved cases can't be ignored. One does have to consider the, the challenge of that for some victims they're going to die before they get justice and for us to be dishonest about that uh, and not deal with that in some shape or form, whatever that is, uh, it does need to be talked about. What he's, what he's raising needs to be talked about. Indeed, truth has trumped justice before in our peace process. In the search for the disappeared, for example, where those who give information are immune from prosecution. But even then, there are problems facing up to the past. 
people don't want to engage for a variety of reasons. And I think if you take that when they're asking very practical questions, you know, how, how far did you take someone into Bogland or on the beach? They're not asking why they were taken, how they were taken, who took them and what they did with them. Uh, and yet they can't get very practical answers. Some people just simply do not want to go back there. But most agree the status quo can't continue. There comes a time where the denials, the half-truths and the lies will no longer, in essence, cut the mustard. People don't want vengeance, but what they do want genuinely is a sense of a recognition and acceptance of what happened was clearly wrong. What are the consequences of us not facing up to our past? Unless we face up to our past in a constructive, healthy way, then I think we are destined to continue to have a, a, a society which is divided, where there's violence around the edges and potential for bad things to happen. As a human being, it's impossible to, as it were, just draw a line when you've suffered a terrible hurt. Someone who's been killed won't come back. And you can't just draw a line and say, well, just forget about it. The issue is now with this American, Dr. Richard Haas. Whether he recommends the soft option of storytelling or includes the harder option of truth recovery, there's no pain-free prescription. <laughs>